Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming. Once again, the attendance at this particular event never disappoints. Uh, my name is Ron Fiamma. I'm with AIG, a private client group based out of New York. And along with our partners uh, from Bridgepoint Risk Management, we're thrilled to, for the fourth year in a row, be sponsoring the Pebble Beach Classic Car Forum. Uh, this has been a great event for us. Um, not only do you get to meet a lot of new friends, we meet a lot of our uh, existing friends and clients. Um, but I think most importantly, uh, we get to do things that help foster uh, our favorite uh, hobby and passion, which is collector automobiles. Um, I'm in the insurance business. We insure uh, the lives of successful individuals. Uh, we do everything they have. My responsibility is insuring the fun stuff they collect, their fine art, uh, their wine, their baseball card collections, and of course, um, my favorite, their collector automobiles. And um, what we get out of this, um, this forum is the opportunity to really educate, uh, which is important. I was chatting with Donald Osborne this morning in the green room about you know, the need for more education, the need to bring more young people into the hobby. And I think that through these seminars, uh, we give an opportunity to, to talk about different topics uh, and whatever is necessary to help keep the hobby going. And so that's probably the most rewarding thing about being the sponsor here is bringing education about our hobby um, to the public. So we appreciate everyone coming. Um, I think our next guest need no introduction, and uh, I think it's going to be a very, very entertaining educational panel. So with that, uh, please welcome uh, our guest, Donald Osborne, and Jay Leno. Thank you. Fuck up, folks. It's time to assess and caress with Donald Osborne. If you love classic cars, then Donald loves you. Stop playing Shaboom by the Crew Cuts, okay? <laughs> and Danny and the Juniors, I don't know what you're talking about. At the hop, really? <laughs> it's just for you. I see kids like this, what's that music? Ah! It's that crazy music for young people that you remember. Yeah, you gotta play Slap the Bitch Up. That's something like that. <laughs> something the kids enjoy. A romantic love yeah, song. Yeah, a nice love song. <laughs> Well, uh, once again, uh, thank you, Ron, very much for your introduction, and it's great to be back here at Pebble Beach, here by the sea with my friend Jay Leno. And uh, today's topic that we're going to chat about is an interesting one, I think. Replica, recreation, or revival? When should what's gone stay gone? Um, and it's sort of an interesting thing to talk about uh, here at Pebble Beach, where obviously uh, we celebrate the original, the preserved, the uh, carefully curated and cared for. But uh, there are times when those things are gone or um, you can't have access to them. And uh, I know that Jay is somebody who enjoys all types of enjoyment with cars, including more time in the shop than on the road, uh, or as much the time on the sh in the shop as on the road. And so uh, he's had some very interesting experiences with uh, bringing back things that have been gone. And so. We're going to talk about uh, how that relates to the car collecting hobby in general. And uh, we're going to start with, why didn't they build? So this is a car which I think is very interesting. Do you know about this car, Jay? The Packard. Is that 53? It's a 53 Packard yeah. uh, Caribbean, but it's a Pininfarina design, which they never actually built. And the collector uh, bought the plans for the car at the Russian Mobile uh, uh, flea market and uh, had a shop actually build the car for him. OK. Uh, and your question this is, is This is something and upon which Mr. J. No, I Leno think, I has think it's no great. opinion. No, no, I do have an opinion, but I'm, I'm by Carl. I like all kinds of cars. <laughs> I, can, I can go either way. You can go either way, yeah. Uh, um, so actually, it seems somewhat subdued for a pin of Pina Farina car, because the front end is totally Packard. Mm. Only the rear quarter and the spats seem to be Pina Farina. And even the roof is higher than I would have thought it, it was. Was that meant to be a production car? It was meant to be a, a custom body limited production car. They made a design for a coupe and also a roadster as well. Did they ever display it at auto shows and things? Or what they never it? built it. Oh, they never, it was oh, never okay, built it. never so built it. So this okay. fellow hired a, a uh, body company to build the car oh, okay. from, the, from the original plans that he bought at the flea market. 
Well, I think that's great. The thing I love about it is it's obviously a passion project. It's nothing that you're going to make any money on. And that's why you do it. You do it for love. You do it for, to preserve the hobby, to show what could have been. No, I think it's wonderful. And I think it's probably a valuable car. It's built on a standard 53 Packard chassis, I imagine. Was mm -hmm. that the 327, 327. straight eight yep. uh, flathead? Great motor. No, it's, a, it's funny. It looks like a production car. It doesn't look like some sort of wild concept. I'm surprised. That, and actually somewhat restrained for Pina, Pina Farina at that time, isn't it? Well, Pinafrina was doing a lot of very clean styling while some of the other Italian bodybuilders were doing very American, sort of transatlantic. Uh, no plug for my book, Stile Transatlantico, Transatlantic Style, A Romance of Fins and Chrome. But um, it, uh, you can see some of those uh, more flamboyant designs in, in that. And speaking of flamboyant designs, which aren't flamboyant designs. Oh, I went back. I hate that. There we go. Oh. This is a car you may know. Well, that's my car. That's a car oh. we... Uh, <laughs> That's a car we recreated. It's a real Duesenberg and a real Duesenberg chassis, all Duesenberg parts. But it was called the Grand Coupe. It was uh, Gordon Buring. He built two of these. Uh, the idea was it was built on the long wheelbase chassis because even though the normal 142 inch is pretty big, they were not real good ergonomics. And, and you get in your bit like this. So this was the long wheelbase. So someone who's six feet tall could actually get in this car drive it comfortably. It's a wonderful car to drive. And Marcel, the bodybuilder, made us the body. He did it at age 88. He made this body. It took uh, 10 years to do, uh, just because he's 88. <laughs> <laughs> it takes 10 years when you're 88. So you had uh, the plans for this car, however. We had, we had all the original plans. The only thing that existed were three factory photographs. That was it. We just had the plans and we created the car. And to me, it's a real Duesenberg. Um, most bodies were built outside of Duesenberg anyway. You'd send it off to Mary Mack or anybody else, Murphy, the most common, and they would make the body. So for me, it's a real Duesenberg. I would never say it was if this chassis did not hold this body, but the same Duesenberg, 153 and a half inch wheelbase, did hold that body. So. Uh, it's a real Duesenberg, but I would tell people the story on it. I wouldn't pretend it left the factory in these colors or, in there or, or with that body on it. This is one of my favorite concept cars of all time. Great GM's 2006 car. Cadillac 16. And it never went to production. No. Would you, if you had a free afternoon, two or three, want to build another one? It's interesting. This is Bob Letts again. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a great, it harkened back to the great era of the V16 Cadillacs. And I saw it at the show and was blown away. But by then, that was 2006 was the beginning of the green movement in earnest in automobiles. We even built a car called the Echo Jet. We had a jet engine that ran on biofuel. We took it to the auto shows and we used, you know, non-animal skins and all artificial things for the interior, all that kind of stuff. I thought it was a great idea. It was just the wrong time to come out with a 16-cylinder engine when the Prius and all this was, were sort of making their debuts. Uh, yeah, I think it's great. If they had built them, it would be a hugely valuable car today because that very easily could be some Bugatti variant at this point, you know, with a 16-cylinder engine. Uh, I thought it was great. It looked great, nice style, still looked like a Cadillac, but unique. Uh, yeah, I think they should have built it. Well, not, they wouldn't have made any money. No, but today as a collector, do you yeah. think that uh, it would be an interesting project to, to, to build another one? Yeah, the trouble is all, all brands have a price point. It's like the NSX had to be called an Acura because they thought calling it a Honda, nobody pays 150 grand for a Honda, so let's call it something else. And that's what happens like when Cadillac came out with their, uh, what's that, the XLR? XLR, uh, yes. Which is supposed to compete against the Mercedes. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, people, well, I'll just buy a Mercedes, you know? I mean, that's kind of where people went. So Cadillacs kind of peak out at 100, maybe 110 max. This would have to be 160, 170, and then people go, oh, I could get a Maybach or something else, you know? So probably smart not to make it, but it would have been fun if they did. I think it would have been amazing. And uh, this is a car that uh, we had on uh, one of our segments on the show. Mm -hmm. um, it's an amazing car, the uh, Ford Mustang uh, prototype show car that uh, actually 
did run, running and driving car, but they obviously... I saw uh, it when it was called the Allegro. I was 12 years old, and it used a Ford Taunus engine, which was a German Ford engine. But it was the precursor to the Mustang. It even has the Mustang badge on the front of it. Um, is this something you can see building uh, another one in your shop? No, because, well, in your shop it'd be fun, but yeah. the idea was it was a two-seater Mustang, and the two-seater Thunderbird, they learned their lesson with that. Once they went to four seats, they sold a gazillion of them. You know, they doubled production, so a two-seater Mustang probably would not have sold. The whole idea behind Mustang was it was a family car that was sporty. The great thing is the horse on the front. Do you know the story? This is one of these stories that has been around, and I've been tracking it down. The horse on the front. There was a guy with a really long European name. I can't remember what his name was. He's, he's a stylist in this. And he was an equestrian. And he was in the 1938 Olympics. And then World War II started, and he got drafted. Okay, uh, he was in, And since he was equestrian, he was in the cavalry. And when his commanding officer got killed, he was made commander. And he led the last charge of men on horseback with pistols and bayonets against tanks. Got wiped out. He survived, came to America, was the designer, and that horse is an homage to the horse he rode in that last. And it all sounds very romantic until you realize he was fighting for the Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> then you go, ah, ah. Well, I know I like the story so much now. But yeah, he, he was on the other side. He was attacking our troops on a horse. Yeah, Boom! Tanks. Well, thank you very much. And everybody go, everybody, and you see people start to tear up, and then they go, yeah, but he was a Nazi. Oh, okay, well, okay, forget about that. I'm glad, he's, I'm glad he got wiped. He didn't get wiped out. But, yeah, but it, it was just, a, it's one of those stories, that, and nobody ever talks about him, but it's one of those lost stories. For perhaps that, good reason, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> This is a happier story. This is one of my favorite cars in your collection. Yeah. Um, and this is, uh, well, why don't you describe what it is? Um, I wish you told me all this before we come in here. This, uh, 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 hold on a second. One of the reasons why everybody in this room really enjoys our segments is because Jay knows what cars we're going to see, but doesn't have any idea about what we're going to say about them. So oh. spontaneity is actually Jay's well, this middle This car name. was built by a guy named Barnes in 1951, I believe it was. And he was a guy that had absolutely no money. But one of those guys, oh, you know that greatest generation of just natural born mechanics. And he went to aircraft junkyards. He's got, this was for Al Unser, uh, senior, to drive at Pikes Peak in 51. He built a Cadillac engine, made the chassis, made the radiator, hand formed everything, LaSalle, uh, three-speed rear end. Uh, uh, it, it's just a fascinating. And with with disc, disc brakes in '51, he got off a plane. Inboard disc Inboard brakes. Inboard disc brakes. Yeah. He drilled for lightness everywhere. Drilled for lightness everywhere. Cadillac engine, and it had a. Uh, he took a body from an Austin Healey and made a fiberglass mold that was quickly lost or just. Anyway, his son had this in the garage, and he was moving to uh, Chile in South America, and uh, he said, will, will you keep it? And I said, sure, I'll keep it and preserve it. And, and there it is right there. So it's really a fascinating, uh, just a fascinating piece of history. When you look at it, the, the detail work on it, and you realize, like movies that are done with no money, it's all imagination, you know? He, everything, like you said, everything is drilled for lightness. It's got disc brakes. Uh, the transmission is back here. It, 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 you know, the, uh, the generator runs off the drive shaft. There are all kinds of interesting little things on it. So it's, it's a fascinating piece of history. Would you ever want to finish it, or do you think anyone ever should finish it? Well, it's one of those things where the fun part is in the details of the chassis. You put a body on it, and you go, you know, underneath this. <laughs> <laughs> and people go, oh, I want to see. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I've got an Owens Magnetic, which is a very early hybrid car in 1916. And it's a gas engine, and it's called Magnetic because there's no mechanical connection between the engine and the drivetrain. The engine starts, a flywheel spins, which is a magnet, creates a magnetic field, which spins the electric motor, the electric motor powers the car. The idea being there was no clutch, there was no shifting, 
So people that had a bad leg or couldn't drive a standard shift car, you just moved a rheostat like on a, like a Lionel train when you were a kid, you know. So it was an electric car, and since batteries... A Lionel a, train, by the way, and he's complaining about the music that yeah, was playing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's make a note. Yeah. Yeah. Lionel, Lionel trains. trains. Yeah. I was doing that for the older people <laughs> like yourself. <laughs> I know, exactly. <laughs> and and uh, it was just fascinating to look at because, as I said, there was no mechanical connection. The engine would spin and that would spin. So they, they called it the car of a thousand speeds because you could vary it. And it was like, you know when opposing magnets, you put them together, the car, they kind of do this. That's what it does as you go, as you sort of, quote, go through the gear. And once I put a body on it, I just had to explain what people couldn't see, you know. But it's got a really neat badge, though, with the lightning bolts. Yeah, with the lightning yeah, bolts on it. But, it. but it was really cool. So to answer your question, I'm not going to put a body on it. I like it just the way it is. And the next car is, is one which will be quite interesting to you, I think, because you are a um, connoisseur of great design and practicality. And this is one of those examples of a concept car that when it made it to production, a little was lost, so perhaps you might want to think about a project oh, to so. recreate the concept car. The Pontiac Aztec. <laughs> That's the concept. It's not a bad looking concept car, but what they built was sort of... Actually, it's a bad looking concept car. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, that, was, um, that was Cherry. Uh, yes, Wayne Cherry. Wayne Cherry yeah. designed that. Uh, I, I saw him here a couple of years ago. I took him for a ride in my Arbor. I didn't bring up the Aztec. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know what they were thinking on that one. Uh, you know, it looks almost Citroën-esque. Yes. It looks French. Because the French love these kind of weird things. Uh, and yeah, it just, it just sort of, uh, yeah, it didn't, it's like the Queen family truck store. It's one of those things you go, know, <laughs> why, would, why would you build that? Yeah, and it was obviously not a success. No. Well, they have their adherence, but uh, uh, the next section is sort of, they didn't deserve the crusher. Cars that they made but didn't continue with or uh, they did in small series and were later destroyed because they didn't want to uh, put them out in the public. And of course, my absolute favorite example of that the Chrysler Turbine car. Right, right. Oh, I love my Chrysler Turbine. That still feels like the future. You turn that key, whoo, and you pull away. And the concept behind it was fascinating. There's no warm up. You drive away immediately. It's, it runs on any fuel that burns with oxygen. Um, when they took it to Mexico, they ran it on tequila. They did. When they took it to France, they filled the tank with Chanel number no. five. Any fuel, but in 1963, gas was 19 to 26 cents a gallon, so why would you want alternative fuels? And it couldn't run on leaded fuel. That's the only fuel it wouldn't run on. So consequently, people had to go find a kerosene pump or a diesel pump. And those were, back in the old days, the diesel pump was always at the back of the station where the trucks were pulling trucks were. in a greasy and dirty. Uh, the, the biggest hindrance to this car was the fact that it's a jet, and jets are inherently very dirty. Um, they can't, uh, you can't clean up a jet, I mean, I mean emissions wise. It just, everything just comes out, it just burns it and goes out the back. Um, that, that was, they knew they wouldn't be able to meet the 1968 emissions, which they knew were coming in 63 or 64. They built uh, 55 of these, and it was an interesting experiment. They ran a contest, they said, who wants to drive a jet car? And if you wrote a letter to Chrysler, uh, like, you know, 800 words, why you want to drive a jet car? And 209 Americans were chosen, and each got the car for three months. And they would keep a diary of when they put fuel in and what happened with it. And people loved it. To this day, I get people come to my garage, guys in their 60s and 70s now that were 12 when their dad got the car, you know, and that kind of stuff, or they remember it going by. Or, I mean, it's really a fascinating concept. It's just, shh, it's, it's turbine smooth, it's really quiet. There's no heat out the back. It actually runs cooler than a piston engine. It's about 20 degrees cooler. People think they used to set the grass on fire and all kinds. Of, no, that's, that's not true because they had uh, regenerators. They regenerate the heat would go through and through and through until it was cool coming out the back. The trouble was uh, Ghia did the bodies in Italy and they were brought here on a temporary visa, visa, so they didn't have to pay tax. And then after the experiment was over and Chrysler realized there was no future in the turbine, they had to crush them because uh, 
they were afraid people would, you know, put a Hemi engine in it or a 318 or whatever because the body style was so attractive. But you don't uh, think that today, with the, the technological laws we have today, it wouldn't be worth building another one because, again, with the alternative fuel no. issue. Well, the interesting thing was they crushed them because they couldn't give them away. They offered them to museums. They offered them to trade schools. Everybody said no because it was a new car. Nobody was interested, which seems unbelievable now. So all but a half a dozen were crushed. And mine is probably the only one that gets driven on a regular basis on the street because nothing breaks. If something does, it's catastrophic. <laughs> But nothing does. It's only got a couple of moving parts. And the Peterson has one, but the, ones, the museums that did take them, and only three did, I think, the engines had to be made inoperable. They had to pull out all the internals so they can never be used again because, because of liability and all that kind of stuff with Chrysler. But it's a fascinating glimpse of the future. I mean, it still feels like uh, like the future when you turn the key and, and it, suddenly you're in 1975. Yeah, yeah, it pulls away smoothly. And it was never meant to be a race car or a sports car. It was a, quote, personal luxury car. Uh, and, and, and so it's, I think it's probably one of the most valuable post-war cars just because of its uniqueness. You know? It's an amazing vehicle. Again, yeah, one of my really favorites. Um, and this is a vehicle which also no longer existed, and uh, this is also in your garage. Okay, this is obviously makes me president of the More Money Than Brains Club. Here. <laughs> <laughs> the original of these, anybody of a certain age, probably guys a little older than me, about my age, uh, in the 50s, all the Grand Prix races were in Europe. Portugal, Spain, England, Germany, France, all around that area. And the Germans did not like to fix their cars at the track where everybody could see what was going on. So they developed this with a gull wing engine and it was the world's fastest car transporter. It ran the Autobahn 108 miles an hour. And when there was a race, they'd put the car on the back, they'd race it to Germany, work on it all night and have it back before the next race the next morning. And it became hugely popular with kids. And somebody at the factory in 1967 said, this thing is taking up space. What we, we don't use it anymore. Just crush it. So they crushed it. And the outcry from like German kids and toy manufacturers, what are you doing? That's gonna... So they built another one, and it cost them $2 million to build theirs. This one costs about four and a half to build. It's a 180 uh, Mercedes cut in front. And then, I mean, it's a, it's a full working uh, you know, transporter, but it doesn't have a gull wing engine. It just has a Mercedes truck engine. But it's a lot of fun when you go to Mercedes events. It's fun when there are like eight people that know what it is. You know? <laughs> so you get that one guy, oh, the one guy makes it all worthwhile. What was that thing? Uh, but it, you know, we put air conditioning in it. We use it as a, a transport. It's my transporter. It's, it looks awful low to the ground, but we have an air suspension that brings it up. So it's, you know, it, it's kind of cool. And your question is what? Should it be crushed or what did you think? No, it's yeah. the fact that uh, replicas were made of, of this, and that's obviously a good thing in your mind. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I agree. And uh, to, complete the, uh, to complete your uh, Ren Transport replica, yeah. how about building another one of these? Uh, a W194, because the Mercedes Museum is not selling theirs anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, that would be great, but what do you, you can't... I, I mean, the thing that makes it unique is it's the only one, you know? And when you start making... You know, I, when I was a kid, I used to love the um, Auburn boat tail speedster. <laughs> and then Glen they Prey. started making those yes. Glen Prey replicas, and they're a bit like... They're just off, you know? <laughs> You ever see those St. Bernards where they have both pupil in the same eye and the dog, you know, you, know, you walk up, they go, rah, 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 rah. they walk right away, there's something wrong with this St. Bernard. It looks like a St. Bernard, but it's a little screwed up. You know? and, and, and that's what I always thought about those Glen Prey. To me, it ruined the look of the real car. It's when you see a bad fiberglass Cobra replica, and it's just a little, like the St. Bernard, you're just a little off, you know what I mean? So, uh, so my fear is that nobody would get it correct. My fear is that nobody would build it properly. And there's some stuff that should just remain a dream car, you know? Uh, that, that, that's what I like about it. A great segue to our next car. I know that uh, there's a few of these around that the Mercedes uh, keeps around. And you have uh, had one of these as a guest in your garage many times. Yeah, I drove one. It's a fabulous car. It's a fabulous car. Originally meant to have a rotary engine. 
Uh, I, I, it, it was their next uh, variation off the Gullwing. Uh, I drove one in Germany and, uh, and here, and yeah, really a fantastic car. How about a project like the Wrench Transporter to build another one of these? Well, or I, yourself? I, I, you know, the thing is, you want to do it right, and it would cost you, I, I, what would it cost you, two million bucks to build that, something like that, probably. But Easily. Yeah, I just, I got another job, you know. <laughs> <laughs> The next is uh, an example of a car that disappeared and was brought back. Okay. Uh, this is a racing car. Right. This is a um, 1955 Lancia D50 Grand Prix car. Uh, after Lancia handed over their racing department to Ferrari, um, the Ferrari used them the next season, won the world championship, and right. then destroyed all of them, right. except for two that had been kept back. Uh, one is in the uh, FCA Heritage Museum, another was in the Museum of the Automobile in Turin. My favorite thing about this car those are gas tanks on each side. <laughs> and the drivers are smoking. That's my favorite thing. <laughs> That's my favorite thing. None would survive if they had survived. Because, I mean, you ever see those guys that got their cigarette and they love the helmet? And you've got 200 gallons of gasoline on each side. So no matter which side you get hit on, you're going to get sprayed. With it. Hilarious. But there were four original engines left and right. two transaxles, and so they made four replicas uh, of those cars with the uh, original engines and transaxles and with the gas tanks inside. Now, of course, they're fuel cells, right, right. so, uh, so they're, rather, they're rather safer than they were in yeah, 1955. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, so do you think this is a, a good idea, what they've done? Well, I think it's a great idea, but who's they? Is it the factory? No, it's not the factory. Okay. Is no. it Crossway and Gardner? Who built these? Um, they were built by, uh, actually they were built in Italy, um, by the fellow that uh, worked with Launch Factory. He was the original fact Launch Factory mechanic. I mean, to me, if it drives, handles, and looks like the real thing, uh, that's, I mean, yeah, I think it's great, you know? It's like going to a strip club and she's got fake boobs. That yeah, works for me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm a giant, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. There's another example. for me, all right. We'll skip this one for a reason because I don't want to go there because it involves uh, uh, racing around Sicily. But the Chrysler Norseman went down on oh, the Andrea Dorian. On the Andrea Dorian, yeah, yeah. That was uh, 1956. 1956. Yeah, Andrea Dorian went down. It's still down there, by the way, if you want to go get it. It's <laughs> just sitting there, guys. Wouldn't it be easier to uh, build a new one? Yeah, it'd be a, hopefully a very big air pocket near the kitchen if you're in it. So. <laughs> you're just sitting there waiting to... Uh, well, I mean, it's a great show car, but look at it. How impractical is that thing? I mean, that's, a cantilevered roof. Don't you, don't you want to make that work today? That looks like the Marlin, doesn't it? It looks like that Marlin, that American Motors deal. And the back with no bumpers and no... I mean, it's a great show car, but it's, it's nothing you could really... Uh, it's probably more famous because it went down than anything else. You know? So I guess you wouldn't be interested in uh, doing a Club de Mer. No, I remember these. I remember these. Uh, Give, give us a story on this one again. This is a, um, a, one of the Motorama, GM Motorama show cars right. from uh, the 1950s, 1956 uh, Pontiac Club de Mer. It debuted the big Pontiac new V8 engine. And the amazing thing is how low, incredibly low it was, 39 inches I'm going to say this woman must have the longest ankles in history. How does, <laughs> how does, I mean, I'm the car trying to figure out where, low. where she is proportionately here. It doesn't make make any sense. She has to always behind, be behind that car to look normal. I think yeah. she's actually probably standing on a platform. I think she's standing on guess. a platform. Yeah, that would be my guess. Um, but uh, just saying, but she's still standing but, actually waiting. But it's not an attractive car. You think it's an attractive car? Absolutely not. No, a horrible looking thing. The front end, it, no, it's awful. And the hubcaps don't match either. That looks weird. Looks so like it's, it's something out of a good James Bond that, yeah. uh, movie. Um, but now, this is another thing. When old is new again, the whole theme of this is supposed to have been about uh, reproducing cars that are gone or, or right. things like your, your Duesenberg. But what, about, what happens when the manufacturers get involved? This is a car which you're very familiar with. Right. Uh, Steve McQueen and the, the Universal lot in his uh, uh, Jaguar XKSS, right. uh, which he bought uh, and uh, loved and sold and bought back and is now in the collection of the Peterson Museum. And uh, of course, 
Jaguar built new XKSSs right. based on the chassis of the nine that were lost in the fire. What do you think about that? Well, the interesting thing was they couldn't give this car away when it came out. Uh, the idea was they had all these chassis left over, so they said, let's build a street version. D-type chassis. D-type chassis. They built a bunch of these. Could not like the 427 Cobra. It seems incomprehensible now. But back in the day, it was too much money. It was impractical. You couldn't lock it. There's no doors. Uh, you, you, there's no key. You couldn't, you know, it, so it, it just, it was too expensive. They just couldn't give them away. In fact, I used to see this car, a guy named Fleischman, Fleischman, I think, in California. I, when I would go riding my motorcycle, he would often pass me. He just drove around Malibu with this thing. And at the time, it was $200,000. You're out of your mind. Good <laughs> luck, pal. You know, and now it's like, uh, what, $17 million car, something like that. Plus the fact that Steve McQueen owned it. And it is the greatest car to drive. Uh, I often, uh, I have driven replicas of it. And I go, these are okay, but it feels like a Jag. This doesn't. The engine is canted, lead it over a little bit. Um, different engine, it's dry sump, it's more horsepower. It's just, I thought it was one of the greatest cars I ever drove. And it was still at the point where an idiot with a talk show host could borrow it and drive it. They wouldn't do that anymore. But, but when I had, oh, it was fantastic. I loved it. I thought it was the greatest car I ever drove. So the fact that the factory rebuilt it to the same specifications, they didn't use a standard Jaguar motor and just stick it in there and say it looks like it and sounds like it. It, it actually is. I mean, it's built by, in the factory, with, and I think uh, Norman Dewis, Norman Dewis had who, a hand who, in, who just yeah. passed away, he was involved in overseeing it because he tested the original one. He just died at age 99 in, what, 362 days, something like that. So for all intents and purposes, it's a real one built so, by the factory, and it's cheaper than the original. So. And then there's the, uh, the other replicas, like the uh, Tempero replicas built in uh, New Zealand. Okay, now look at that opening of the grill. Okay, there's your St. Bernard again, just a little <laughs> bit off. It, it'll like, hey, well, hey, Mr. Hey, hey. You know? Hey, how you doing? Huh? It looks like a face. It, I mean, it doesn't, it, it's not even close to, there's something about that. I know it looks similar to the same, go back to the other one, turn back to the grill. It, it doesn't, it just looks off. It just looks off. So I would go with the factory building. <laughs> Aston Martin DB4 GT, mm -hmm. uh, amazing, successful race car, the Zgato model, one of these are about $14 million uh, today, so the Aston Martin factory decided, well, we've got some extra chassis numbers sitting around, so we're going to make some new ones, just like they made the old ones, right. uh, but these are not street legal, because they don't, they're new cars that don't meet any right. of these specifications. Right. What do you think about that? Well, I don't know what you do with it. I guess it's a piece of art. You put it in your museum. You can't drive it anywhere. I suppose you could drive it in Saudi Arabia or someplace that doesn't have the same restrictions that we have. Um, it's built, by again, by the original people. Same technology. Same motor as original. Um, yeah, so it's, it's real one. You just can't do anything with it. You, know, you just can't, can't drive it. You know? That's sort of the sad part. I mean, that's sort of the golden era. Is there any, and this is not a slight on Aston Martin, but is there any new Aston Martin that looks better than this? No, you know, I mean, this, this, you know, this is the last days of aesthetics conquered. Aesthetics conquered aerodynamics, conquered everything, because it had to have, now, this not, I'm sure that's about as aerodynamic as a brick, but it looks, <laughs> it looks proper to the eye, doesn't it? I exactly. Mean, it's just a beautiful, it, you know, the best looking cars, are both masculine and feminine in the same form. They have feminine curves, but they have a, like, the, like the haunches over the real wheels. Those look like, like an animal about to leap, and yet it's smooth. It's the kind of car you enjoy washing with a hose because you run your hands over the whole thing, you know what I mean? Exactly. Now I'm a creepy old guy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have all those videos of Jake yeah, caressing yes, his yes, cars. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, and uh, our final example is, is something that is very interesting, I think, to me, uh, when this came up. And a phoenix rises from the ashes. This is a, a Mercedes. Uh, it's right out front. You it's right out front. Many of you, when you came in, you may have seen it parked outside. And it's an absolutely beautiful, spectacular example of, of one of the best pre-war Mercedes ever. Um, this car was born as this model, a Cabriolet B, which is a mm -hmm. very nice four-passenger uh, touring car. And uh, 
All that was left of it after World War II was a twisted chassis and a, uh, an engine with a hole in the side of the block, some instruments, and uh, a few other assorted pieces. Mm -hmm. And the owner decided to embark on a project that saw him do what, as you mentioned before with the Duesenberg, you go to Mercedes-Benz, you order a car. This is what they sold you, a chassis and an engine. Right. And then you could choose from their factory bodies or from whatever uh, body build you wanted to take it to. And so he chose to uh, employ great experts who have done uh, great Pebble Beach quality uh, restorations uh, to create this special Roadster body mm -hmm. for the car as if he were a customer designing to do this in uh, 1938 or 1936 rather. What are your thoughts? Uh, well, it's a rebodied car. So maybe it's 10% less than the real one. It bet. I mean, it's nice to have, well, I have the only real one. I mean, I think he's done a beautiful job. This is obviously a labor of love. That's got to be well over a million bucks. A million, I'm guessing a million one, a million two to restore. And it took him, what, seven, eight years. Uh, and it's a real engine, a real chassis. I mean, go with what, uh, what the, uh, the law says, you know? Is it real chassis, real engine? Then it's a real car, you know? It's like, remember the last scene in uh, Miracle on 34th Street? Ladies and gentlemen, no, no great authority in the United States Post Office says this man is Santa Claus. <laughs> they, they, they had to declare him Santa Claus. Was, and to me, it's Santa Claus. It's the real car. I mean, okay, it, it doesn't have, it's much better looking than the original one, but it, I mean, if you bought a 65 Mustang and it was a coupe and you put a fastback body on it, it's still a Mustang. Yes, it's, it just didn't leave with that body. You know, a lot of this stuff to me is rich guys throwing silver dollars in the ocean to see who gets more, who's got more money, you know? Like Corvettes used to just be Corvettes. Well, now it has to be a matching number Corvette. Oh, but this engine, came four months after the production line. It's the same engine. Most of them are re-stamped anyway. You can't tell a difference. But, <laughs> but, I mean, he didn't me, actually say that. <laughs> no, but you know what I mean? I mean, to me, the owner loves his car. He enjoys driving it. It's, it's, it's a recreation. Well, it's not a recreation. It's, it's the real car with a different body on it. I mean, suppose you didn't have this body. If you just had the chassis and the four wheels, like that previous picture, Oh my God, people, that's $2 million. Well, you put a body on it and what, it's, it's less now? You know what I mean? I mean, you're not gonna find another one. Uh, I, I would contend any Mercedes expert would go through this and tell you, yes, this is 100% authentic. He's done it as, as good as you possibly can. I mean, to me, the thing that's ruined this type of thing is all the bad replicas we've seen over the years, you know, the bad, uh, you know, the St. Bernard cars, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, yes, they, a special roadster on a Volkswagen chassis yeah. doesn't no, have Oh, well, my favorite, my favorite. There, there was an ad <laughs> that run, it ran in all the car magazines. You could buy a XK, uh, what, uh, what, what, what's the Mercedes, 1929? Um, oh, SSK. A, SSK Mercedes, and it had a Volkswagen engine in it. <laughs> and in the ad, Dad's got it laid on the garage floor. Timmy's handing him the wrench. Mom's got a, a paintbrush, and little Susie's got something else. Oh, and the whole family is building this Mercedes van. <laughs> okay, that's what made you go, hey, wait a minute. You know, made it all very suspicious. Because in the old days, people would do this and just be, oh my God, that's a, what a genius. What an artisan. I mean, to make that, it's unbelievable. You have no idea how many hours in the frustration. But, and then you, you look at some, some bad replica you know, like a Clinet or a Zimmer or something, uh, you know, it's... Any Clinet and Zimmer owners here in the audience? <laughs> no, see, they wouldn't show their face here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. I mean, re you buy this car because you love the car and you have the passion for it and it recreates an era, probably <clears throat> before the bad era, you know. Uh, but okay. Uh, and where the claim, the Zimmer, those cars are just to show off. You want to pull up in front of a golf club in Florida or something, you know. Uh, no, to me, I, to me, this is a real car. I, I, would, I would love to own that car. I would pay real money for that car. And maybe if I was trying to negotiate a deal, I might say, uh, it's worth a little bit less than it. But I, I'm guessing it's probably better than the real one. A, you have new wiring, new everything, but all done to original specs. So I think it's... Uh, I mean, I thank God there are people in the hobby that have the resources to save these and to bring them back and help recreate it for another generation. Because to see a picture of it or read about it in a book is one thing. When you see it parked outside, you go, whoa, wow, that. I mean, it's genuinely striking. 
I mean, it really makes an impression on it, especially on kids or people who have never seen cars from this era. It looks like, oh my God, what is that? You know, and it's done proper. All the proportions are right on it. So I'm, I, I applaud them, and I think it's great, and I would love to see more of this kind of thing. It's something that um, here at the, uh, at the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance, on a few occasions, they haven't done it for years, they've actually done a new couture class. Right. So that cars like this. They don't like do that this, anymore? They haven't done it for many years. And uh, it would be terrific. Uh, everyone applaud if you'd like to see another one. Um, I think I so. Think, because there are amazing artists out there and artisans creating uh, for, for cars that are original chassis that have lost their original bodies. And right. we, we can no longer uh, enjoy any of those cars. And uh, so I think that, indeed, I agree with you that uh, the owners should be applauded. And the answer in whether, uh, obviously, things should be brought back or recreated is uh, something that you should decide for yourself. It's uh, something that I think uh, Jay has certainly done in, in his own shop and with his people uh, has made some remarkable uh, restorations and recreations of, of cars. Some of the other cars we didn't get a chance to talk about are some of the uh, aero engine cars, which were very, very fashionable uh, in Britain in the 1940s <laughs> yeah, and 50s, yeah, yeah. and yeah. you've got that spirit running through you somehow yeah, they're from hilarious. Massachusetts. Oh, hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, absolutely an amazing thing. So um, always remember, obviously, if you love classic cars, then I love you, and uh, I think Jay does as well. Any questions? Absolutely. Question time. Yes. Hold on, we're gonna get we're gonna get microphones. Yeah. Hi, Jay. Hi. Uh, in about 1964, in a different lifetime, I actually worked at Ford Motor Company with Charles Kirstash. Ah. <laughs> and he was a sculptor modeler. He was, of course, not a designer, but... Uh, Is that a true story or not? Uh, mostly true, yes. <laughs> Charles was a legend in, in his own mind. We called him the Count. I, and, of course, he always said he was Swiss. He, never, <laughs> he would never admit to the other. I deny him! <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Uh, and of Bordenay, our vice president, actually owned two Clinets. <laughs> Ghost, you know, a couple of our designers did work on the uh, Zimmers, too, at the time. But that's, again, another story in another lifetime. Allegro was a separate car. They actually oh, had was it, a, it wasn't that car? No, it wasn't. Okay. We actually made a couple of the uh, little Mustangs. And another little fascinating sideline, one of the designers, my friend Phil, he did the little horse on the front, the design of the horse. Charles just sculpted it in the clay. Oh, okay. Well, that, but, no, that's good to know, because I've, I've, I've never found anybody that... And a tidbit, when you do see the car, if so. you see it, the horse is actually coming at a three-quarter front clip at you, and he looked a little too squashed up. So when we actually did the car, the, the Mustangs for the production cars, we turned it complete sideways, and that went on and on. Now, I also heard a rumor that <laughs> Lee Iacocca had the horse turned around and said, had the horse facing west. That as in, go west, young man. Was there any truth to that? No, we usually tried to make the horse going towards the front of the vehicle right, or right. something yeah. like that, to the, you know, left to right. Okay. Well, that's fat. What was the guy's name again? Charles Kirstash. That's what the Count. Yeah. Kirstash. Cool. Uh, well, very cool. Count well, thank you for straightening what, what, that what, up. One other point on that is, um, it's also he is 105 years old, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 82 today. Pe 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 people you also have to sing. I've heard pe you pe sing. Pe pe people also comment on the fact that the horse's legs are configured in such a way that yes. if that was a real horse, the horse would be on its face yes. in the next frame. But it looks much better with the legs all tucked up okay. underneath. Look more aerodynamic. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you. That thank was you. thank you for that. That was great. That was great. Because I've I've never been able to you know, find anybody that knew anything about this. So, and I, I would tell this story and go, I'm not sure, but this is what I heard. So, so there's the authority right there. So. Question on this side. Jay, you have had automotive interests for a long time. When you think today what your interests are in collecting, is it on one-offs? Are you more focused on an area? area? Or are you very uh, eclectic in your thinking? Boy, eclectic. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> I buy the story... To me, if there's a story to the car, it's hilarious. Did we tell the story about my 67 Chrysler? I don't know if I told Oh, that. no, please do. I, one day I got a call, Jay Leno. My name is uh, Pupkin. Yeah, I forgot his first name was. I'm 92 years old. I can't drive anymore. I want you to buy my car. I said, well, what do you got? You got a 67 uh, Imperial Crown Coupe two-door with dual air conditioners front and back. And I go, well, that's kind of a big tank. It's not my car. Ah, Jeff, you come look at it. I said, where do you live? Sunset Boulevard, Beverly Hills. I go, okay, we're right there. Now, 
now I'm William Holden, you know? Now I'm William Holden. <laughs> so he's like, he's like two miles from me. Right? So I go to this guy's house, and it's the long driveway, and I pull up, and he's there, he's 93, he's got an ascot and a smoking jacket, and he's got a guy with him that looks like me, about 70 with gray hair. He goes, Jay's my mechanic, he's from Chrysler, he comes once a month to service my car and check it over, he wants to retire, that's why I gotta get rid of the car. I said, okay. <laughs> Okay. And then he tells me his story. And his story is he was a producer and he produced African American films for African American audiences. But real films. He had the black James Bond, uh, the black singing cowboy who was the Gene Autry. He just died. A famous, he's yeah. like 100. Do you know who I'm talking about? He was, um, ah, he was a famous African American uh, cowboy actor. And he had all pictures of, you know, all these kinds of things. He had them all in his house. We go in his house, his house has not been touched since 1948, 1950 maybe. Right? As we walk around his house, there's a picture of this beautiful woman, you know, one of these kind of pictures. I go, well, who's very pretty? He said, well, that's my wife. I said, oh, well, she's very beautiful. She said, well, it's, oh yeah, she's here. We go to the door. He knocks, goes, Jay, honey, Jay Leno's here. She goes, I, I, I'm kind of busy right now. I don't want to come out. And then he says to me, she doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, so, so I said, uh, oh. You know, so I said, well, I, well, that's okay. I said, well, nice talking to you. I'll see you some other time. Said, yeah, nice meeting you. Thank you very much. Okay. And then he, goes, he goes, let's go outside and I'll show you the car. Right? So we go outside and he opens the door. And for all intents and purposes, it's a brand new 1967 Chrysler Imperial. And he goes, if you buy the car, you got to take all this crap. And he opens the other garage door. He bought extra bumpers, extra wiper motors. He bought everything he had in case the car was ever damaged. He had just tons of spare parts. Well, now I have to buy the car. <laughs> I mean, I have to buy the car now. It's a, and it had 144,000 miles on it, but it looked brand new. The car is so, amazing. And I still have it. It's a dual air conditioner. You turn it on and the air goes back and forth. I mean, within seconds, you're just freezing in this thing. It's just the most hilarious car. And just ab complete absence of road feel. Just no road, no road feel of any kind in this thing. So, and then, I, then I bought it. And I bought it from him. You know, so I, said, I mean, that's a case of... The story was great. I mean, he's got a smoking jacket. He's a producer. Here, he's got a movie star wife who doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I mean, it was fantastic. I had to buy the car, it was great. It was he could preserve the car, but not the wife. Yeah, question exactly. question in the back corner? Yes. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, I have one here. Who'd you know to get that seat? Okay. Hold on, we have oh, one in the front you. first. Uh, yes, sir. Do either of you have any recollection of the Ford Brooklyn and why that seemed to never, never go anywhere? Oh, Malcolm, the interesting character, Malcolm Brooklyn. Uh, when I first moved to LA, the guy next door for me had a Brooklyn. It was, it was supposed to be a safety car, remember? Yeah, Malcolm uh, Brooklyn is a really interesting character because he's also the person who introduced Subaru to the U.S. Right. Right over all those little Subaru 360s and right, right. Uh, all that stuff. He, he had lots of automotive ideas. That the trouble of. was he got his engines from one place and somebody else made the body and somebody else did this. And it was mostly a quality control problem. Mm. He pulled the gold wing doors down and the seals didn't seal. You know, the average car has, what, 10,000 parts in it? And when you're a guy like him, you're buying all your parts from somebody else. So your quality control is really this. You just hope it doesn't. And they, there's a lot of warranty work. And then uh, I, he was using an American Motors engine, and the, the, they shut him off. And then he started buying 351 Fords. I mean, it was, that's why I always give Tesla so much credit. He actually builds a car. I mean, he gets it out the door. And the quality control is good, and he's, it's, he sells 100,000 a year. People think Tesla sells like 2,500 cars a year or something. They don't, they sell 100,000 cars a year. And the fact that he can get it that far is amazing because guys like Malcolm Brooklyn, Brooklyn, like Tucker, he wasn't an engineer. He was a guy with a dream and he had a few bucks. Malcolm he, Brooklyn was a salesman. Yeah, a yeah. Salesman and marketer. Yeah, he's a salesman and really marketing a car guy. guy. He wasn't an engineer. And that's why it didn't make it. But they're interesting cars and they're very collectible, I think, now. Because it's really an interesting, it was the first sort of safety car. It came in safety colors like orange and lime and all that kind of, And it had the big bumpers that, you know, that uh, accordion did and all that kind of stuff. But no, they were interesting, interesting cars. A question on this yes, side? Uh, ah, yes. Young man. Okay. Oh, there you go. Right. Is that Mark right. from The Rifleman? No. Yes, it's Mark from The Rifleman, exactly. <laughs> <All right. laughs> 
Yesterday, the first plug-in hybrid Ferrari was released. What are your thoughts about electric supercars? Oh, I think uh, electric supercars are great. I drove the, uh, the new Tesla Roadster, the prototype. It does a quarter mile in 8.8, 0 to 60, 1.8, 630 miles on a charge, and allegedly the engine's guaranteed, or the motor's guaranteed for a million miles. There's no fluids, there's no maintenance. It's pretty much the future. I mean, I have a Tesla, and I've had it three years. I've never done any, anything to it, but wash it. But Jay, for a sports car, what is the toll it takes on your voice if you don't vocalize in the morning? Because you've got to make vroom vroom sounds while well, you drive true. it. Well, that's true, that's true. Well, that's true, that is, that, that's true. But, but uh, no, I think that is the future. I, how old are you now? How Twelve. He's getting 12. older and older. Okay. No, that means we're, we're, he, we're well, getting he's older. Well, he's But I would predict a kid born today, I've said this before, probably will, will drive an electric car, will drive in a gas car as often as a kid today drives in a stick shift car. They'll still be around, mm -hmm. but I think it'll be mostly. I mean, I, I see where it's going. Look at Audi. Look at Porsche. Uh, I mean, they're all going uh, electric. Uh, to me, the, the Chevy Volt, brilliant car. I had one, I put 70,000 miles on it. I didn't do anything to it. I didn't even change the oil because most of it was electric. We just went around town, you know, we got 40 miles free every day. We used it at the shop to run errands. And Bernard would take it home to work those 26 miles, so he never really, we put gas in it. I mean, it was a joke, every December 3rd, we put gas in it. <laughs> Have a little and gasoline and that party. Was it, yeah, and I never changed the oil. And I think the gas engine only had like 4,200 miles on it out of the 70,000. And it was brilliant and you realize you know, for technology to succeed, it can't be equal. It's got to be better. And you're at a point now where Tesla has a 340-mile range. Uh, it's the fastest accelerating four-door sedan you can get. And there's no maintenance. So, But the driving experience itself. Well, the driving being, experience being changes, getting, doesn't right. it? It changes from electric to steam. It's the same from steam to internal combustion. And when I talk to people about a Tesla experience, they go, Ah, oh, it's so quiet. I love this thing. It's you no know, shifting. I don't feel the engine. It's a different... I mean, the absence of noise is almost as uniquely interesting as an abundance of noise. It's in the middle where it gets boring, you know? And like, yeah, I can kind of hear a Camry engine. I don't care, really, you know? Now, I don't, that's not a slight issue. Isn't it? But the idea of just going through... You know, the idea of stepping on the gas and going zero to 60 in two seconds. You can't step on the gas. And, well, you, well, you don't have to step on the pedal. But I mean, the fact that the, fact that the cop didn't even notice you <laughs> because you made no noise. He oh, just, just went right by. You know, he's on his cell phone. He didn't know. You know so, so no, I, I mean, it just becomes a different experience, you know? It's like rap music and rock and roll. They're both music. One drives you nuts, one you love. Okay, whichever one it, whichever one it is. Yes. What's up, guys? Thanks for coming out. Um, just question, Jay. What was your first car ever, first, and what was the story was a behind it? First car was a Ford pickup truck. I got it. It's bought new. Yeah, that's right. Bought <laughs> new. I paid three hundred fifty dollars. My dad and I dragged it home, and I was fourteen. I had two years to get it ready for uh, when I got my license when I was sixteen. And I used to have nightmares. But what if I can't drive a stick? What if I? Can't? Oh, oh God. You know, when you're a kid, you worry about stupid stuff. You know. And, and, I, and I used to think, what if I can't drive? What if I, I just, just not a guy who can work a collector? I used to worry about all these things, but that was my first car, and I, I, yeah, I really enjoyed it, yeah. Yes? How many cars do you own now? How many cars do I own now? You sound like my wife. Uh, <laughs> you remember this well, one, honey? It used Mavis, to be blue. Mavis is, not, <laughs> Mavis is not here, so you can answer the question. Yes, but stuff. see, but one wife on 100, 187 cars. So that, see, most guys in Hollywood have one car and 187 girlfriends. <laughs> this is actually healthier and cheaper. And, and, and so that's, 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 yeah, so vehicles that's right. or cars? Vehicle, what's that? Vehicles or cars? Vehicles, 163 motorcycles and 187, uh, and they're all insured. Every day is sticker day. <laughs> put this in, and another sticker on the Of course, in the back yes. there. Yes. Oh, hold. The last car I got? The most recent. Almost. Well, there are yeah. a couple. I found, and I, I thought this is, again, this is not a car I was looking for. Guy buys a 1957 
pink, although Desert Sage is the original title. Uh, Imperial, electric windows, every option, <laughs> in 1957 for his wife. She goes, it's too big. He parks it. It sat from 63 until I got it. Original paint, original chrome, it looks brand new. I drive it around and people go crazy in this thing. It's that uh, uh, Virgil Exner kind of mm -hmm. just that wild. The forward look. The forward look. Suddenly it's 1960. Remember that was a big, yeah. And uh, it's a fantastic car. My I mean, favorite thing about it are, are the instruments. Yeah. Because they're so small, they're almost unreadable. You mean they're, so big? Exactly. Oh, That's, yeah. I'm joking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the yeah, large yeah. type yeah, edition. If you need your that... glasses to, to see these, you shouldn't be driving. <laughs> And then I got a 1925 Cadillac from Farmers Insurance. They, it was their first car they ever insured, and the V8, and you know, things started to break out at starter motor, gas tank leaking, you know, get this thing out of here, it's a fire hazard. You want it, Jay? I'll take it, boom. And now we've gone through it and got that running. And a really unusual car called the Kleiber. Uh. They only built, well, there's only two left. It was the only car built in the city of San Francisco. And Paul Kleiber is the grandson, and he goes, uh, I got this thing, I, I can't afford to keep, I don't know what to do with it. If I give it to you, will you keep it and fix it? I said, sure. But the unique thing about it is, being the only car built in the city of San Francisco, it has massive brakes. The brake drums are as big as the wheel. It's basically a truck chassis with a car body, car body on it. It's eight cylinder. It's a great driving car, and it stops right now. I mean, no, it's really good. You know, most old cars, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, you try to use that accident avoidance technology where you're, you know, you're doing it. This thing, I drive in LA traffic, I hit the brake, it stops right now. I mean, it's, I mean, it's an old car, but it's got these just annoying, and that was the selling point. The only car you could drive in the hills of San Francisco. And at the time it was, because in 1927, most cars just had rear wheel brakes, and you pull it, they lock up, and you're sliding down the hill. Whereas this thing, seriously, the brake drums are that big. They're just massive, and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It is one of those time machine moments that I often think about, imagining what traffic was like in San Francisco in the mid and late 20s. I cannot imagine it. And not as much imagining brake fail in San Francisco. <laughs> I mean, the hill is still the same. You, know? right. you go down it now, and you go, people don't even know what brake fade is anymore. I mean, with older cars, that was the idea. You hit the brake and the pedal goes right through the floor and that's all there is. Sorry. I mean, there's not, there's, that's, that's what it is. So, I mean, yeah, it was, uh, it's a fascinating car to drive. And it's fun to jump from a McLaren F1 or a P1 and then you get into Kleiber and you, it's, it's, it's interesting. Yes? My favorite car. Well, I don't have a favorite. You know, it all depends what sort of mood you're in. Whatever you're working on the last or whatever you're fixing. You know, I always try to rationalize why I'm driving. So, well, I have to road test it now, you know. You know, it's that kind of thing. It's like, I, I, I'm very, pr I come from New England. You know, I have a pool <laughs> that I've, I haven't been in the pool in 30 years. <laughs> because I have that Boston voice. It's I mean, I father. get up to the it's pool and I hear, oh, is this what you do now? Where you're hot shit, exactly. you sit in the pool, you're a rich guy? I go, no, no, you got nothing broken? <laughs> no, you're right, you're right, I got stuff that's broken. I go back and I get close to the pool, <laughs> but I, I, I can't go in it. I, I, I can't get to the pool because I hear that, oh, is this what you do, Mr. Hot Shit? You, need, no, to put a, you, need, you, you need to put a pool in at the garage. And pull in the garage. Then you get closer work. to the and pool. I could, and I could clean parts with it, get in there. <laughs> then, then, then it's okay. It's yes. Different. He will. He will close out with a toy. I, 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 and, and I'm sure you got your hundred dollars from Mr. <laughs> well, how unusual that the same guy that asked last year. <laughs> yes, Mr. Osborne will close out with a song. Yes, attractive person. Yes. Uh, okay. Hi, Jay. So I'm from China. Oh, really? Like, yes. I'm, I thought that was Texas accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, what can I do for you? Um, what I'm here for? No, what was your question? Oh, my question is, you know, because a lot of people in my country cannot see the cars car every day. So I was wondering, any chance you would open your garage to public, maybe only once a month? The what? Well, open, uh, if it what? Open your garage to the public. Maybe well, no, you time. can't open them. They won't let me, because California, you have to drain all fluids before the public comes through, disconnect all batteries, have the not drink contents of battery sign. You have to have all those things. <laughs> 
But what we do is, if people make a donation to a charity, then we, we do it that way. If you're coming uh, actually, to the Concours tomorrow, you will have an opportunity yeah, to raised, donate to a charity raised, and get a yeah. visit to the garage. What did he raise? A million four last year. Yes. And 100% goes to the charity. But you know, I was in China and I met with some, Bentley brought me in to talk to some Chinese design students. And it was fascinating because everybody here has a history with the car. You design a car and, oh, that looks like a 57 Corvette and that kind of looks like an early Thunderbird. But in China, these kids were designing cars without wheels. One looked like a flying egg. One looked like, because they don't have a back history of growing up with cars. So it was interesting to see what a completely blank slate would do without any, without having all the, uh, all the influences. You know, the car I drove in when I was a kid or my dad had a Lincoln, uh, so I got a little bit of Lincoln in it. Most of these kids, their parents never had an automobile. So the idea that they would design future transportation pods almost, a lot of them were. I mean, a lot of them looked like traditional cars, but most were sort of a futuristic version, and it was, it was fascinating, it was really fascinating. Yes? Uh, in the theme, uh, theme of this talk, yes? 72 is going to be the what is it? The, uh, the Delta Marshall P72 is being uh, uh, showcased today. Right. Uh, is, it among, is it a Pantera? In other words, should they bring back the Pantera? Well, I don't know. They're not calling it a Pantera. No, they're calling it a P72. I mean, I, I, it's a, I, I suppose they could. I, it, it's a name that resonates with people, so I, I think it might have some value. I don't know whether they will do it or not. That's, that's pretty much up to them. I think it's, I've got a Pantera. It's a fascinating car. Um, uh, I don't know. You got me on that one. I don't know what they're going to do with there. I don't know. Yes? You know I collect cars, do I ever sell cars? Get out! Get out! I have to add to that, the, the very first, the very first um, one of these seminars that Jay and I did together, um, I, I said to him, we were talking about why he collects and, and how he collects, and um, I said, you know, your collecting uh, method is sort of like a roach motel. Everything comes in, nothing goes out. <laughs> And everyone laughed. No, no, thought, you got out. And, and everyone, <laughs> <laughs> everyone laughed, and I thought, what did I say? I was afraid to look at Jay. I thought, well, it was really nice doing the show with him for a season, so, you know. <laughs> no, we, we, we auction cars off for, uh, you know, I had a uh, Fiat, one of the first Fiat 500s, a new one. And we brought it up here to auction off, and I brought in Panetta and a couple of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And we auctioned it off, and we made these rich guys feel so guilty, you know. You're driving all these cars because of these guys, you know. He's got the generals going, like, we got $600,000 somebody gave for that uh, Fiat. And it all went to uh, the Wounded Warriors and the USO and all that kind of stuff. I mean, they're all good, so I'm making fun, but, but it was really fun. And that's kind of fun. So we do that when we have a car. Uh, a lot of times the manufacturers will give us a car. Um, we got uh, the first... Uh, Corvette, the first, was the ZR1 last generation, and, we, and, and the, uh, the thing was moving kind of slow at Barrett Jackson. We got up to about 500 grand, and I said, what do I have to do? Do I have to bring out the President of the United States to get a, uh, all right, come on out. Then George Bush comes out, and the whole place goes crazy. <laughs> and we got a million, too. So I wouldn't do that today. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes, President Bush is probably busy. Yes. How do you feel about the new Corvette? You know, I love the new, I was, I, was, I was one of the first people to drive it, and like everybody else, I thought, oh, here's the marketing plan. They'll continue to make the C7. That'll be the base Corvette, and this thing will be 180 or two and a quarter, like the NSX or whatever. And it's $60,000, brilliant. I, I, you know, I love the fact you know, General Motors never used to take chances. They did it once with the Corvair, the most European uh, American car ever built, and they got their ass kicked on it. I thought it was a brilliant car. I still think it is. When I drive my, my Corvairs around, kids go, is that a Carmen Gear? Is that, no, it's a Chevy. Well, it's Chevy. Where's the radio? No, it's Eric. What? I mean, they don't know what it is. And it's, it's a fascinating car, but they got so stung by that because the Mustang outsold them four to one, even though they sold 1.8 million Corvairs. 
I mean, you do that now, they make you president of the company. But back then, you know, Ford had sold four million Mustangs, so that was nothing. So the Corvair, they said, that's it. No more crazy engine in the back. Let's just build our, the usual Pennard system, engine, transmission, rear end. Everything will be that, you know. So, uh, well, then they did the Tornado, and of course, and Eldorado. But they took a real chance here because you read all the forums. That's not a real Corvette. I bought my first one in 53. You know, so you get all those guys. So the fact that it's completely different, I, I think, is great. And it immediately makes the C7 all of a sudden look kind of old-fashioned. Because the base car with, uh, is six, it's, it's, under, it's barely under, but it is $60,000. And, and fully equipped, it's with the Z51 packages and everything else, it's maybe 78 or 80, whatever, unless the dealer sticks something on there. But uh, I thought it was, I thought it was brilliant. I mean, they've, they've done a wonderful job. It's got a real trunk. You know, you can actually carry stuff in it. I've got an NSX, and maybe you can get a Hershey bar or something in there. But that's what, <laughs> and it's, it's a third of the price. The NSX out the door was 205, you know? And it's, and it's a V8, and it's 500 horsepower, and it's faster to 60 than the ZR1 right now, the top of the hill Corvette. So, I, I, I am so proud of American manufacturing and, and the fact that American engineers can compete with Lamborghini and Ferrari at a third of the price. No, I, I, think, it's, I, think, it's, I think it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant. And yes. I'm sorry, uh, this is the very last question. Wait, attractive person, yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, my daughter. Okay, yes. yes. <laughs> oh. What started my fascination with cars? Ah. Well, I grew up in New England, and it's, it, you had to be somewhat mechanical. There was always broken snowmobiles or, you know, lawnmowers. And my mom knew nothing about cars, but she knew when the Valiant wouldn't start. You opened the hood, took off the round thing, stuck the screwdriver down the little round thing, and then turned the key, it would start. So everybody had a basic knowledge. Plus, to my generation, the car was the iPhone of the day. You know, guys sit home and they'd say to their girlfriend, oh, uh, text me a naked picture. Okay, here you go. Okay. And anyway, we had to get in the car, drive to the girl's house, <laughs> make sure the parents weren't home, somehow convince the girl to take her clothes off. Then you took the picture. Then you had to find a drugstore three towns over that didn't, that didn't know your parents. They would then take the picture. You'd wait a week. The picture would be back, and there would be like black bars. Remember, you get the black bars here and here and here. And then it was like, so it was a whole different, I mean, it, it was the iPhone of the day. It was a horrible experience. And kids are lazy to sit home, send me a naked picture, okay, fine. You don't need to get, you don't have to go anywhere. But, but uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much why. Yeah. Well, thank you very much all for coming we'll end today. On that note. We'll end on that thank note. Thank you, guys. Who? Oh. And, and. By popular demand. Oh, that's right. Any chance you, popular could, you demand. Could sing? If you love classic cars, then we both love you. Yes. Now, my, now, they probably don't know. They don't know, you know. Donald actually, Donald actually is a trained opera singer, and you performed all over the world, correct? That's Paul Opera Solist, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so that's pretty cool. I gave up my singing career just to be with Jay Lee. That's right, so, that's there right, you that's right. So, thanks, everybody. Thanks, you guys. Thank you very much. Oh, there you go. Oh. <laughs> That's it all. Wow.